Okay, here we are, everyone. Good morning. How good, are you? Good morning, Emily Miller. I'm good. <laughs> I feel very accomplished, as I was telling Emily right before we got on the live that Janice and I got a lot accomplished today already. That was you know the man and winning. That's right. We're doing a good job. Um, it is Friday, so happy Friday. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone watching wherever you are. Today is Friday, November 17th. And you know, folks, I we have been so, I always say this, I always start off the same thing by saying we've been so busy, so I don't know why it should be any different. But this week has been so busy that I couldn't get my days straight. So I was wondering why Emily was looking at me so funny on Wednesday when I was all, okay, I'm Friday and we're going to do monthly mixes. And then, and she's like, mm. <laughs> and then, then we got off of the thing and she goes, I'm doing bullion on Friday. Right. And I went, all right. <laughs> Great. Perfect. I always blame it on the time change for at least two weeks after the time change. Good one. Okay, perfect. It kind of fouls me up. It messes up my sleep, messes up the dogs. The dinner time thing is always a struggle to fix that. You know, they don't seem to care in the morning if they get fed at like six or at eight. It's not a big deal. No. But in the afternoon, Roscoe comes up and goes, Yeah. On my arm. And I'm like, What is dinner time? And he goes, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so excited. It's yeah. so dinner time. <laughs> no, that's how the cats are now. Since it's getting dark early, you know they have about an hour before they get fed to go outside in the backyard and rustle around and stuff. And they come out now. It's like three o'clock. They're all we're going outside, and we're like, mm, okay. Um, well, of yes. course, I'm eating dinner at five thirty, like truly, you know, early bird yeah. special. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah, we did. We ate dinner at five thirty last night. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. It kind of throws me for a loop. I wish we would stop doing the time change thing. Pick one, stick with it. And just. Well, I am one. ready. I am I, telling you, I'm I, ready for that. I, I got to tell you, it kicks me in the butt every time. And the other in the springtime is actually worse. I think um, yeah. the fall is not so bad because I'm already getting into hibernation and right. You know, the like thing... a bear eating a lot of salmon. Um... <laughs> <laughs> salmon and berries. That's what Chris says. Yeah. <laughs> salmon, uh, the bear is his spirit animal. Yeah. No, it's true. But at least in the spring, it gets lighter. Uh, you know, all of a sudden it's lighter later. And you're like, oh, oh okay. I, you know, last night we went, we got some dinner. We came home because Thursday night sometimes is our eat out night or take out night. Not that you need to know this, but I'm in the story now, so I better finish it. We come home, we eat dinner, we watch a little TV, and Chris and I look at each other, we're all, oh, we're exhausted. I'm thinking it's like nine o'clock. It's 7.30. <laughs> I'm all, okay, perfect. Well. I have found that I can kind of sink into the studio a little bit more in the evenings, where in the summertime when it's so light outside still, yeah. I'm up till, you know, I eat dinner at 8.30 or nine o'clock, and, right. and then I have to be up for a couple hours to kind of digest that for a minute, but. Right. Last night, I spent a couple hours in the studio. I got a few oh. things done. I had cleaned a little bit, and then I destroyed all that again. Yeah. yeah. As one does. And, one um, does. It, you know, it's it's nice to kind of move through some things and, and uh, uh, do it at night. And then I suddenly I looked at the clock, and it was like 10.30, and I'm like, oh, shit, I got to get up at 6 tomorrow. <laughs> Should go to bed. Better get going. Yeah. We are having a rain out for Saturday, so. Oh, no bummer. Off. Bummer. Bummer. Which means that I have to do some deep cleaning because I'm having Thanksgiving at my house. So I was going to ask, how are your Thanksgiving plans? Yeah, my uh, brother's going to come um, over from uh, uh, his house over in Sonoma County. And I think he's going to spend the night, which will make it a lot easier not having to drive home. At the, at that'll the dark, be fun. You know? Yeah. That'll and, be nice. um, you know, we, we're very different eaters. So he's bringing baked cauliflower. Oh. And he doesn't really eat a lot of meat. So, you know, right. turkey, I'm making a half turkey and, you know, all the sides and everything. And yeah. another neighbor's coming over for desserts. And Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be quiet. I mean, actually, in my family, Thanksgiving was not like a huge big thing. My husband's family, definitely a big thing. But, you know, I'm happy for it to be kind of. Kind of low key. Uh, yeah. And then we're going to 
burst into Small Business Saturday. Apparently, the weather's going to be fantastic next weekend. Oh, excellent. Well, I cannot wait. Well, people can, if you're posting anything, people can shop on your Insta for sure. Yes, please do. Yep. You yeah. can look on Insta, anything you see there. I've, I'm working on a conversation with uh, somebody right now about bangles. So, um, you know, you're more than welcome to shop on Insta. And um, I send everything in a little nice little gift box like this. Oh, look at that. Her for her birthday um, today. But, um, you know, I, I tend to like to kind of get everything gussied up. So you're ready if you're looking for a, a gift or a gift for yourself. Yeah, gift for yourself. I love those gifts for yourself. Yes, we're having, uh, we have guests this weekend, then we switch guests. So we have more guests next week. My parents are coming. Chris and I are cooking two kinds of meat, uh, you know, turkey and a pork roast. And, you know, it's going to be. So if anyone needs a place to come, come to our house because we have food for 500 and I'm yeah. not kidding. Yeah. Um, I'm, anyway. missing having, I'm missing having crab for Thanksgiving. We used to do that every once in a while with my friends. I know we're going to do that maybe for Christmas Eve. That's what I'm yeah. hoping. Yeah. Crab. I, I yeah. can't, I okay. haven't, I haven't really checked up on the, what the situation is. With crab. The yeah. When it opens, when crab season opens for us, Betty, uh, Betty is saying, Emily, she loves your necklace. Oh, thank you. It's great. I love your necklace. I said that's the first thing. I actually bought um, these to sell and I bought two strands and I sold one strand and then I kept looking at these and I thought, oh, I love them. And so they're on stamp display. I love it. I love them. Love them. And they're topical for today. So they are. And so speaking of which, I want to show you guys a couple of things and then we're going to get right over to Emily. If you're watching this on the replay, you know, Fridays are a little more um, loose around here, a little more casual. So, you know, Emily and I had a little chat time because we didn't have enough chat time earlier. So we had chat time with you folks. Um, our Ellen, Ellen, who does uh, does some of our social media and stuff like that, she will, down in the description of this show, you're going to see the markers, the time markers. So if you're like, enough chat, Kate and Emily, you can go right to the number one, uh, the, the marker that says, you know, when Emily starts or whatever. So, and she is slowly working through all of our videos. So nice. they'll have timestamps. You can take a look and see, get right to the meat of what you want to learn, like the middle part, the ending part, the putting on the class, whatever. So she's doing a great job with all that. Um, I wanted to also tell you folks that, as you know, uh, we've had a little bit of a glitch with our points, right? Our points, our loyalty points here. So Drea and I have been rustling around behind the scenes. And I wanted to show you folks, give you folks just a quick little tour um, so you can see what's going on. And then I've got one more thing to tell you, and then we'll get to Emily. So let me uh, full screen this sucker so you all can see it. So you can see here we are on the home page of our website. And if you're looking at it straight on, on the right hand side, you can see wish list. There's a wish list there. You can see the rewards program and the rewards, it's hiding slightly behind our accessibility um, uh, thing. So that little accessibility tag, if you need some special accommodation uh, for reading websites, et cetera. Um, if you have some challenges that way, hit that accessibility button. That'll help you uh, to navigate things with a little more accessibility. But the rewards program is also there. So let me show you. I'm going to click on it <clears throat> and I'm going to show you what we've got there. So I'm not signed in. So you can see here, I think you can see it, right? You can see it there. Yeah. I clicked on that and it tells you uh, you can earn VIB very important beater. You can get your rewards. You've got your tiers. And if you haven't joined or you haven't logged in yet, uh, you can do it from right here. Just real quick, when you join, you are a VIB copper, very important beater on the copper level. As you rise through the ranks, you attain silver status and then gold status. And the rewards um, are uh, all tied into uh, all of the, um, 
every single purchase you make. So you can see, you can earn points by sharing us on Facebook, following on Instagram, signing up, celebrate your birthday. And most importantly, when you place an order, you get one reward point for every $1 spent. Okay. So we've also, I'm going to get, I'm going to pull this up so I don't screw it up. Drea wrote this and it's really well written. So I want to tell you the rewards news. Okay. Um, what, uh, there's some good news and some bad news with this. The good news is that everybody kept their points from the old VIB balance, right? Uh, you still have your rewards. You still have your status. You still have all of that. But there are a couple of things that have changed. And let me tell you, um, old VIB rewards that maybe you cashed in but didn't use yet those may be gone. If you still have an unused code, we're, uh, grab it from your email and see if it works. Um, that, since we're using a different um, system, that didn't um, port over. But our Shopify platform, they're the ones who issued that um, reward. So it's still valid on the back end, so it may or may not work. So if you have trouble with it, you can email us. Birthdays, my friends, didn't save. So even if on the old VIB, if you've already entered your birthday in the old system, we don't have that anymore, all right? You'll get a birthday reward uh, when you enter your birthday, okay? You can, we don't share any of it or whatever, and if you don't want to share it, that's cool too. But we have made it super, super easy for you to reward, uh, to get points. Remember under our old system, it was kind of crazy. Um, we, uh, you had to uh, figure out what your reward was and then there was reward minimum. There was all this business going on, right? So what you do now is when you earn points, you're gonna earn one point per dollar spent. You'll reach silver status when you have a thousand points and gold at 5,000 points. Now, the way that you spend the points is for every hundred points, you get $10 in rewards. Okay. And you can spend up to a thousand points at one time and there are no order minimums. So when you go in here, and you go to uh, get rewards, what you'll do is you'll just come in, you'll uh, redeem your rewards, and it'll show you, You can there's a little slider that says, I wanna redeem this many points or this many points. It'll give you your rewards, and then you can use that, no minimums. You can decide how much you wanna use. The one thing though, my friends, is do your shopping first because once you undo it, you make a reward, we can't undo it, okay? So let's say that you have a $100 reward, right? Make sure that you spend $100 on that reward because if you uh, spend less, let's say that your order is only 50, but you have the $100 reward and you um, redeem it, that extra reward doesn't carry over. It doesn't save. So do your shopping first, then figure out how much, how many rewards points you want to redeem. And then you can save those and then use them for the other, for another day. Rewards don't apply to shipping costs. They don't apply to gift certificates and only one code can be used per order. So you can't combine rewards points and um, you can't uh, combine rewards points and a coupon code, right? You will, um, so Lynn, you'll have your status. Your status is still there, right? If you were VIB gold, VIB silver, VIB copper, the status ported over. If you have, and all of your points ported over, but if you had a reward that you cashed in and didn't use yet, that may or may not work. Okay. So 
check it. You should have it in your email. Try it and see if it works. If it doesn't, go ahead and shoot us an email and we'll try and help you troubleshoot it. We're really doing our best to make this VIB thing easier, port it over so it's seamless. So if you have any questions or any hiccups, and I'm going to put this up right now, uh, you know you can find us everywhere on social. Hit that follow, et cetera, et cetera. But there's our email address right there, info at beadshop.com. Andrea will get back to you. Hopefully it's super easy. It's much easier than our last rewards program. Um, so sorry about that, but. I, I Kate, there it is. a round of applause because I have worked at places. I have shopped at places that have reward systems and they're never easy. They're never, you know, straightforward. And it really sounds like, it sounds like this is obviously damaged by improvement. You know, you're getting, you're getting going to have something better at the end. And it's just taking like that minute of. That minute of adjustment. Just yeah. over. Everybody's got to translate into the yeah. new, into the into new the language. New. That's you know, right. Um, well, thank so you. Applause. And the FAQ page will also be updated. So it'll talk to you about all of these things. Um, as well as I just read straight from the newsletter that Drea sent out this morning. So it should be hopefully not clear as mud. It should be a little clear, <laughs> but uh, we should be in good shape. Small businesses don't have the, they don't have the weight to sling around to kind of demand certain things from their vendors, you know, and you kind of are at the mercy of what you can, you can apply to your own little business. And, yeah. and, and beat shop is a small business, but not a tiny business, not a micro business like me, but, Bead shop is a small business and, and there's not, there isn't three guys in the IT department whose job it is to sort all this out and make it connect and work at work together. No. Sister, I know when, when somebody says you need more weight on your tent, I'm like, I'll go to the store and buy some rocks and fill my bags and duct tape them together. And really I need a new banner. Okay. I got to design that now and, you know, figure out how to get it printed and get it there. And, oh, and that's too big. Oh, okay. Back well, okay. Room. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I am our whole IT department <laughs> right here. Thank goodness. IT, marketing, IT, janitor, staff, all, of it, all of it. Bookkeeping, tax and so, taxes. That's right. Sales and use. I Every time I fill out my sales tax, it says, are you a paid tax return? I go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I pay tax. Sure. Sure. sure why not? Sure. Why not? Well, uh, so anyway, so if you have any questions, folks, let us know. But I think all of the bugs are fairly uh, ironed out. Also, uh, as a reminder, and I know you guys are super patient. We have the best customers in the whole wide world. I hate to ever disappoint anyone for any reason, but sometimes it happens. We had a little glitch with the, um, the monthly mix launch also that was supposed to be today. There was a hiccup and it didn't, a couple of things all combined to make it happen that our mixes did not go into stock today. They're going into stock tomorrow. We've checked, they're in, they're scheduled, they're ready to go. Um, but, uh, so you'll see these, these are going to launch at midnight tonight, uh, 1201 on November 18th. So sorry, uh, folks, I know Drea got a couple of, um, got a couple of emails saying, where's the monthly mixes, the redos. So you'll see them there on, uh, there's a little box on the homepage that reminds you tomorrow. It'll go at, uh, midnight Pacific time. It'll go. Okay. So that's that. So people are starting to ask about the French bullion, my friends. I so I'm, I'm watching the YouTube comments. I don't seem to get the Facebook one so quickly. So mm -hmm. um, I sort of hang out and watch the YouTube comments. Um, Liza, I see what you say about using French bullion wire for years. Um, so when you say a closed jump ring, I'm assuming you mean a soldered jump ring. Mm -hmm. So most of the time when I say jump ring, I mean one that's open. And when I say soldered jump ring, I mean one that's closed. I think what you're asking is, do you have to use a soldered jump ring? 
you don't have to, um, but it is kind of the point of building that bullion around the ring or around the connection to the clasp. Mm -hmm. So it seems like most of the time one would. I wouldn't build the loop of the bullion and then try to insert a, a jump ring into it later. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's a little, it can pull that loop out of shape. Yeah, and you're... it's a little, to be honest, um, store-bought bullion is a little bit fragile, a little bit yeah. fragile. And it yeah, is something that when you handle it, you have to be a little bit careful. Once you got the thread through it, and if it's a fairly snug fit through the bullion, then you're kind of safer. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it, it's typically that I would use a solder jump ring with bullion. I mean, mm -hmm. not not everything I would do it that way, but typically, yes. Okay. Um, well, I, there was one other, was there one other question here about Oh, something? I think I. Sorry, I'm scrolling down well, back again. Maybe I'm going to go ahead, Emily, and highlight your workstation. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm going to mute myself so, again, you don't hear me bustling. Oh, uh, again, it's okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, and Robin is saying, uh, Emily introduced me to French bullion back in the day at Bobbles and Beads. Yes. Oh. Those good. days. You know, um, I, 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 it's funny whenever we start talking about findings and I kind of I put bullion wire under findings in the category mm -hmm. of my own brain um when I first started making jewelry I had a lot of uncertainty about how findings were going to work and how they were going to hold together and was it going to be a secure connection and was it never going to break like I had I had the vapors or the horrors of of my necklaces falling apart on people that I'd given them to and um, I really like knotting in between my beads. And most of the time, bullion is most commonly used when we knot in between our beads. And that's the traditional place that it's used in pearl, using it in pearl knotting. But you can knot between any bead. And one of the things that kind of comes along with um, doing your own designs and getting, getting more evolved is that you want to kind of press the envelope a little bit about what you might be doing. Like, I want to use bullion wire, but I'm using big thread, like I'm using Ceylon and cause I need to make big knots between my beads and how, how do I make those kind of things match up? And I, I was introduced to bullion, um, in, in the spirit of knotting between pearls in the bullion makes a really smooth transition. I'm going to actually slip my necklace off because I had it on today on purpose so that I can and show it's you so where pretty. Hot and Emily, like there's to... also a, a handout too. And the handout yeah, is on. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like to use bullion wire where the bullion wire is protecting the thread from rubbing on the clasp. So the metal of the clasp and the thread that we use sometimes is not a great combination. And I do see jewelry made this way. Um, I used to see more when I had worked at an in-store, in-person bead store because we got a lot of broken jewelry that came in. And when you put just the thread through the clasp, alone with no transition it does build in a place where it's going to wear poorly and so over time it's going to fail and using bullion wire to protect the thread it also keeps the thread from getting tarnish on it which with silver is a real thing and will happen um so bullion is that transition that helps us protect the thread where it rolls over the clasp and it gives a nice kind of refined finished look to a piece where we then bring the thread through the beads, through the bullion, through the clasp, and then back through the beads again. And then we knot as we go down again. So when you begin with a, a strung piece knotted with bullion wire, the first few beads you put on, you don't knot through them immediately, okay? You would put on, I usually do about three beads, put on the bullion wire, add the clasp, and then I go back through and knot in between each bead. And then I begin knotting all of the rest of my beads. So it is important that our thread will fit through those few beads twice. And I'm going to show you something you can use to make that happen. And it's pretty easy to use. Um, so with a natural material like a pearl, we can actually open up that hole and make it big enough. On most stone pieces, we could as well, mostly not on glass. So we'd have to make a choice of threads. Um, to make the knots happen between the beads and go through the bead twice. Check glass, which is 
really most of the glass beads that we work with these days, not all, but most of them, actually have a pretty large, reliable hole. So it's pretty easy to get our thread to go through twice and make a knot in between the beads to keep them from um, kind of crunching on one another. You know, <clears throat> I like to knot between beads to keep the beads from rubbing on each other. And for pearls, traditionally, that knot does that job. It keeps the beads from rubbing on each other all of the time. But it also has a job that if the thread breaks, and thread is a material that can fail over time, only one pearl at a time is loose, right? Knots on either side keep everything together. But I think what knotting does for me most is that it actually gives me this really great flexibility and drape. And so I know, notice that with any type of bead, it doesn't have to be a pearl, it can be a glass bead, it can be um, a stone bead, it can be a metal, eh, there's a little problem with metal beads, I'll talk about that in a second. But I will knot with any type of bead. Metal beads, because they have such large holes, are not as often practical to knot next to. And with small metal beads, like spacer beads or something like that, they might uh, also tarnish, the, the tarnish will rub off on the thread. And so it kind of can make it unsightly. Um, so I usually don't knot next to metal beads. And I feel the same way about knotting next to my bead tip or my bead tip cup that I'm using to attach to my uh, strand of three, stringing material to my clasp. I, I like bead tips. I use them often. Um, and I like how easy they are to work with. And if, if there's a time when you can't make these beads large enough to get the hole in the bead large enough to get the thread through twice, then a bead tip can be really helpful. Now, there's lots of conundrums that come up with that. You know, if we have, let's say we have beads with a large hole and the clasp we're using, the finding that we're using is really large. So it really won't accept um, a bead tip and then it won't attach well to the clasp. We've got all kinds of like difficulties. Um, I often think that jewelry making is actually, it's actually problem solving. <laughs> um, 100%, 100%. We, we have little problems that get thrown up to us. Sometimes it's the hole of the bead. Sometimes it's the weight of the bead. Sometimes it's the shape. I mean, there's, there's just, it's, it's just about problem solving. So when that kind of situation came up in my work, um, that I couldn't use a bead tip because of the clasp and or thread size and the bullion wire, the pre-made bullion wire, and that's what this guy, these guys over here are, um, when those were too delicate or too fine to put my thread through, um, I didn't know why I couldn't make my own bullion. And I, I often like talk about this, like making ha homemade soup, you know, we can get store-bought soup, we can get homemade soup. Um, and making your own bullion wire is a great way to kind of approach those difficulties when you have um, a bead that has a large hole, so you're using a large thread, the clasp or the finding you're attaching to is big, and you really want to have something that's sturdy and kind of stands up to it. And, and a lot of that is not even really talking about the aesthetics of your piece. Really, I'm just start, starting off with functions. Aesthetically as well, I like to build things that kind of look good together. And I talk a lot about um, in when I'm designing and people are asking me about how I come up with my designs or how, what I think of when I'm designing. I often think about making things that kind of flow together, that, that match in my eye. And this is my own personal eye. This has nobody's eye but me. Um, but my own personal eye says I want things to flow together. Um, I might sometimes push those flows by having a one big bead and one small bead next to it. And that's kind of how I feel about knots is that they're this little spacer in between the beads and they're almost not meant to be seen. They're kind of a functional thing, but sometimes I'll knot with like red thread and white pearls and that throws everything, all that stuff to the wind because now right, it's part of the, part of the design for I'm sure. Bringing in color as kind of my accent or my, um, a little bit of shock value, you know? Um, you know, when you watch a movie and suddenly the music just comes in. <laughs> right. Those are the same kind of things in, in design that we want to have something that stands out and jumps out at you and makes you look. Um, so bullion wire for me both is a functional thing and it's a aesthetic thing. Um, I and like to make a big bullion 
And oh, I that's see- and Emily, I have just a quick question that sure. kind of relates to what you're doing. Two of them, yep. and then you can. I just want to make sure that I know you're going to talk about them in just sure. a sec. Right now, the whole size of the bullion wire, you're going to talk about that, how you make it, and how you wrap that gauge. Yes. So you can make it different sizes. Oh, yeah. And uh, the color of the thread, Emily, on those pearls that you're wearing, is that yes. a white or an ecru or? Um, hold on. I think I have it right. I thought I had it right beside me. Wait, wait. Don't Nobody go anywhere. Here. Nope, not going anywhere. Uh, it's this guy right here. So it's a white. And it's that's Ceylon, that, uh, Ceylon yep. that you used. Yep. This is a, I think this is the fine. Got it. Ceylon, right. Got it. Um, so bigger bullion. Can and go so over just, leather. just real quick. Sure. And I, then, uh, so Marion is referring to store-bought bullion wire. So the Got bullion it. wire, which is kind of why you, um, started to make your own. Right. The store uh, bought that we carry at bead shop has a couple of different sizes, but if you are using cords or whatever that are larger, being able to make your own opens up a whole, um, a whole new world. Right. Here's a couple sizes of, of store bought bullion. And I don't know if you can see how t- that's pretty good. Isn't it? It's still sharp. Yeah. That's pretty tiny. Right. So I would use something like this with a, um, like a one or two silk and this might handle, um, at least a six silk, maybe up, a, maybe to an eight. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny when I used to, uh, pass these around in class in, in, in person classes, every once in a while, somebody go, I really like it. And, and they'd say, what's it for? And they would pull it apart and it's like, yeah. Whoops. Nothing now. <laughs> yeah, so it's not for anything. That's done, right? So really what bullion wire is, is just this super, super fine coil of wire, right? And I've been talking a lot to JP because we've been discussing bullion. Um, she actually did a bullion class way back. Let me, wait, wait. I found it on the beach shop on the lives here. It is back in 2019. On January 23rd, she did a working with French bullion wire class. So it's a place where you can go back and look at her traditional using it for knotting with silk um, style working with bullion. Now, I like these store-bought bullions very much when I'm working with Softlex. And I know that sounds a little funny because I'm not knotting and I don't really have to protect the thread. But what I am using this for is for the looks, for the aesthetics. Here's a little it, does, it does look so nice. And Here's just real quick. Last night, this is a little tiger's eye. Oh, it's so and pretty. Pearl. I think I got these in Tucson. And Both so I use and- a little bullion here over the soft flex to give me that little loop. You could use a um, wire guardian here. I don't love the look of the wire guardian. If they're okay, but I don't love the look of it. I prefer the look of the bullion. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's right over the clasp loop and over the chain extender. Looks real pretty. Thank and you. when the when you're referring to bullion wire, bullion wire and French wire are both the same. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I kind of got introduced to it as bullion wire, and that's kind of what I call it. Me too. Um, yeah. And it uh, it does have other names. It has names that are like gimp, mm-hmm. which is another name for it. And um, Janice and I were we're doing some research the other day, um, looking at different types of bullion wire. And really this is also used for embroidery. So um, I've talked about epaulets on a uniform, fancy dress uniform for someone in the Navy or someone in a fancy dress, super fancy dress uniform. And it has those um, strands of stuff that hang down from the epaulets, like fringe, twisted fringe. And they're actually covered with bullion. So it's thread strung through the bullion and that gives it some weight. So it hangs really nicely, but it's also used a lot in um, embroidery. Uh, you'll see it in embroidery from India, um, embroidery um, in French embroidery, just in a bunch of different places to give volume and to add metal detailing to embroidery, to really super fancy stuff. Um, I didn't know this, but I just discovered this, that there's a school in, in 
London, I think, where you can actually get a master's degree in embroidery, um, in garment embroidery, <laughs> which I think is sort of super fascinating. And I just saw somebody's like their final projects for their their dissertation sort of, and it was all these couture gowns with heavy embroidery on them. And they were just, it was pretty stunning. It was pretty neat. So back to bigger bullion, homemade bullion. Um, I will like, I would like to use homemade bullion on bigger cords, but also on um, going over leather. So <clears throat> for me, this is one of those aesthetic moments where you're transitioning from one material to another, from leather to wire. And I like the idea of having something that helps me make that little bit of a transition. So this is bullion wire, uh, probably 24 gauge. And I use something kind of unusual, an unusual tool um, in my in my effort to do this. I can use any gauge of wire to wrap bullion around. And really you can use anything that you have in your um, house that is non-tapered. So this is a knitting needle. This is an old school, probably a Susan Bates uh, knitting needle. And if I put it through my gauge here, I don't think it's a zero. Oh, it must be a zero, it might be a zero. No, it's probably a one. It's about a one or a B. So you can actually um, go to the knitting store and buy a set of needles for not very much money, or if you happen to come across them at the flea market or yard sale or antique show, you'll find these knitting needles for pretty much nothing. And you can use these to help you wind your own bullion. And that becomes the coil that would go over the leather, right? And probably the smallest few sizes, sort of a, a zero, one, two kind of sizes would be about the right size. Um, if I were to put a gauge on this to um, give me the millimeters of it, uh, sort of 2.4 ish millimeter. Um, so you can you can look around at home. Um, you might encounter that you have some tools or wire or um, something in the garage that would work for this as well. Um, but this is sort of nice and straight and kind of easy to work with. Um, I'm sure those are hand-me-down needles from somewhere along the line. But most of the time I use a another piece of wire for my bullion making. And I made some samples to go um, with this particular, uh, let me move that guy's that way, Ooh, delicate. Um, samples to kind of show you kind of what they look like sort of side by side. So we can talk about how these look aesthetically and how you might want to use them for um, your designs. So I started off with um, some different gauges of wire and also different gauges of bullion wire. So my mandrel wire, mandrel just means the thing I'm going to wrap around. And the wrapping wire, kind of like we talked about um, earlier this week about our wire framed earrings, right? I took a little bit of tape, put it on the ends of the wire so I knew which wire I was working with. And I did three little samples. And really these are, these are this wires, this bullion is done. <laughs> it's finished and ready to be used. Um, I can leave it on these wire gauges, which would help me match it up to thread that I might have in my stash and might be working with at any point. And I have enough bullion wire on all of these for several projects that I might do, several pieces of jewelry. Um, there's these three are all 26 gauge and these three are all 24 gauge. So 26 gauge wrapped over 22, 26 gauge wrapped over 20, 26 gauge wrapped over 18, and then 22, 24 gauge wrapped over 22, over 20, and over 18 gauge. So you can see the difference, and I'm going to bring these up nice and close, in the size of the bullion that I make. And you know, when we did the wireframe earring earlier, this week, um, we could have gauged that wire up in all respects if we wanted to. We could have moved the um, wire from 22 gauge that we were using as the mandrel wire, and we could have moved up to 20 gauge, and we could have moved up to 24 gauge on the wrapping wire to get a bigger, sturdier look if you were making that same earring with or a pendant with a bigger centerpiece. You might want to gauge up a little bit and have that option 
Um, the wire that was became the head pin that went through the pearl, that was 22 gauge. Now that's a little bit restricted by the hole of the, in the bead, but I could still use different gauges all the way through that to make a different aesthetic look for myself. Emily, I have a quick question for you sure. about what to coil around. People are talking about knitting needles, et cetera. Sure. Um, do you remember that old school thing called the coiling gizmo? I do. I'm not sure what gauge the coiling gizmo or how it relates to knitting the needle. knitting needle sizes or whatever, but you can use any Anything. metal, any metal mandrel. It could yes. be, a, you know, whatever, if you have some glass bead making mandrels or whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, whatever it is, just as long as it's straight, uh, fairly stiff to work with, or even, you know, like you did there, a piece of wire. Yeah. Yeah. Wire's handy. You know, we've got, you know, here's the 18 gauge wire, right? Mm -hmm. I can go big and big and go to 16, go to 14, go 12. Mm -hmm. um, knitting needles just happen to be handy and they're, they're nice if they're a little sturdy. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about bending them in your hand. So here's, here's this 26 gauge wrapped over these different um, wire sizes. So it gives me a fairly fine aspect. So I could use this one over the 22 for um, a size eight silk for um, standard Ceylon or the next one down, which is Ceylon micro. I can never remember how those gauges go. Um, 20 gauge uh, core with 26 gauge over it. Certainly any of the bigger silk sizes. Um, and this 18 gauge probably would handle a 0.5 millimeter leather. And yes, it so, is micro M. Micro, thank you. I can never remember how those go. I know. I, <laughs> I'm the same way. I can't do it. So this gives me a fairly fine look um, without too much um, texture, right? It's a fairly delicate. So I might use these for smaller beads or places where I'm going to use a smaller, uh, I want that smaller attachment look, look for it. So here I bumped up to 22 gauge wire as my coiling wire and over the same gauges, over 22, over 20 and over 18. So you can see this gives us a, a kind of a bigger look to it. Now this might be a place where I would certainly use the 0.5 leather for these guys. Um, and any of our um, uh, waxed linens, might work on these and it would certainly give it a good um, uh, balanced kind of look. You know, I, I, I sort of vacillate with my findings between wanting them to be the smallest part of the design, not, not to stand out. And then there's definitely times where I have a clasp where I want that clasp to say something and I want all of that to show and look really interesting and, and be, be something that's part of my design. It's not just that little functional thing. Um, so for me, it's a case by case basis, right? Um, I'm going to pick the one uh, that I uh, think is the proper for that particular design that I have to be making. So making bullion, making our own bullion, um, we're going to want to work with dead soft wire for sure for our coiling, our wrapping wire. And we might want to work with dead soft or half hard wire for the wire that we use as the mandrel. I'm going to go in here and pull off a piece of 18 gauge wire just because I feel like you guys can see it a little bit better and we'll do a little cut. And when you make bullion wire, I think it's nice to actually have flush cuts on both end of your wire because you're not going to leave it on there. I mean, you're not going to use it on there. You're going to take it off. And it just makes it a little smoother to remove that bullion wire. So I'm going to really give this wire a little bit of a straighten, right? And the nylon jaw tool really helps me do this. And it's perfect that it's also work hardening this wire. So work hardening is the process of unbending or unkinking or bending or hammering on metal which disrupts some of the bonds, the, the bonds of the atoms of the metal, the, the not the atoms, beg your pardon, the um, uh, metallic 
uh, the metals are like little crystals. So it's the crystals. I was kind of trying to get over there. Crystals, so why crystals. Why get that out. It's disrupting those little bonds of the crystalline structure in the metals. Yes, micro crystalline structure. As it's doing that, it's hardening, stiffening, and making the wire more brittle. So we can kind of we use that for us and against us all the time. You know, if I uh, if I make a ring and I don't work hard in it on a mandrel, then the person who's wearing it grabs a shopping cart or um, slams their hand down on the table and the ring deforms. So I want to work hard in, in some cases. And in a bunch of other cases, I don't want to work hard. In. I want to keep my wire at, or metal as flexible as possible. Uh, and I'll let Kate talk to you about um, uh, annealing one day. So I'm going to pull off a piece of 26 gauge wire. So this is going to look very much like what we did on Wednesday. Same kind of idea. Now, I'm not going to straighten this 26 gauge wire much, but I noticed that this end that came off the spool, um, that it's a little bit bent. And I'm going to just unbend that. But you know what? The nice part about this is I'm just going to use this as my starting point. And I'm not going to worry about really straightening the rest of my wire. I'm just going to kind of push it out of the way underneath the table a little bit. So same thing we did last time. I'm going to hold the wire and I typically hold it on top and begin to wind around. Now, if I move down to the end, I don't have to scrape myself on that wire every time I go around. And I'm coiling with pressure towards the holding hand, almost to the point of it overlapping, right? And I don't want to overlap, but if I do, I'm going to undo slightly and start again. And as we're doing this coiling, we're work hardening the wire. So it's nice to start with dead software because it's easier to manipulate. But work hardening means that once I pull it off the mandrel, my wire is actually going to have some stiffness to it. It's going to hold itself in place. And I'm going to come in again with my nylon jaw plier. And I said this last time to um, gripping in your nylon jaw plier, the farther back you grip in the plier, the less effort you have to put in your hand to grip it. Okay. Um, if you grip out here, you're having to hold on really tight. But gripping back here, and this will not damage the wire. It won't mess it up or do anything bad to it. It just gives you something to kind of hang on to. And I would even hold on to my knitting needle in the same spot. Now, if you're using aluminum knitting needles like I had there, that blue one, I would be a little bit gentle. I think mm, it's possibly that I could dent that aluminum knitting needle. I don't know how. I don't know if it's as sturdy as this wire is because it's a hollow. Right? And if I have some little gaps, I could just push them together. It's okay. And I'll probably want to reposition maybe every four or five coils there to get that nice little bit. So bullion wire happens pretty easily, right? This is not rocket science here. It's not too difficult. As I get to the end, I can actually slide away. Beautiful. I don't need to put any lubrication on this or anything. Now, there is this whole section of jewelry making folks who like to work with lots and lots of jump rings. So they're the folks who make things out of what's called chain mail. And Kate knows chainmail well. She does a bunch of it. She's very good at it, although she doesn't show it off as much anymore. Um, they, people who make chainmail, often make their own jump rings by using a mandrel in a drill. And then they hold the drill and the wire, and they wind the wire by turning the, the wire in the drill. And it helps them wind the wire on a mandrel. And it's a great way to make many, many jump rings at a time. I That's sometimes make jump rings, but I don't do it terribly often. Yeah, I, I that's when I have to make a whole ton of jump rings. That's your jam. I, that's my jam. Yeah, that yep. is. And it's it's a very cool thing to see. And then they have this super duper cutter that cuts them all at once, and um, it's like a miracle because yeah. I know when oh, I started oh, metal I that. class that they had us make jump rings and we had to cut them apart with a saw, which is. It's doable, yeah. but it's not the most fun. <laughs> no. to you know me. I'm the only person who loves the jeweler saw. Just me. Yeah, I don't love a saw. <laughs> I mean, I'm okay. I, I use them temp from time to time, yeah. but, you know, um, 
it's it's just not my it's not my jam. That's why I fell into metal clay. That's right. Oh, t- right? so true. I love metal clay too. Yeah. And Emily, uh, it's really that tool. And I'm watching you do your winding. That tool really does hold that wire nice and even. It's not marking your wire. And folks, I want you to notice how Emily is when she's coiling that wire. See how she's coiling that wire really at a at a right angle. That's at a nice 90 degree right angle to her base wire. So she sees, so you see it go around nice and even one coil next to another. Um, perfect technique, Emily Miller. Perfect. <laughs> and, you know, um, again, this also, if you practice this, um, I promise you this will make your wrap loops look a little nicer because it's exactly the same motion, right? We're holding the loop in one jaw of the plier, one side of the plier, and we're wrapping with the other hand. And it really gets your wrap loops. You get really good practice at making those coils sit really close together and look really even and tidy. So yeah. it's it's kind of a nice thing. Um, I've been seeing some wire working happening on the group, and I can see that folks are beginning to do a little bit of practice. And I'm, I'm super happy for you, and I'm super encouraged. Okay, so that's about as much as I think I'm probably going to get out of that piece of wire. But so in a few minutes, I cooked up my own. Pardon the pun there. Um, I cooked up my own bouillon, right? Uh, easy. And don't worry again about the beginnings and the ends because those we're just going to clip away and we're going to make those go away. And you're going to show clipping and everything in a little bit. So hang tight, everybody. Right now. Oh, or right now. Perfect. So <laughs> when I clip again, um, I want the jaw of the tool to cross the wire at 90 degrees. So as the wire is coming off the coil, I'm going to clip it which will seemingly leave a little end kind of sticking out, which I think you actually can see because we're getting our optics are getting so much better these days. And to get rid of that little coil, I can just come in with my chain nose pliers and give it just a little press to get it to go with its brothers, right? And bullion wire can be a little can be a little fussy to store. Um, I usually store it in a little box, you know, like that. Um, in if if you have lots of it, you can actually store it on the on its uh, mandrel if you like. And to make this really good, I'm just going to unwind enough to get a nice clean cut there. And I just, you know, I don't remember if I did this or not when we talked about wire. Can I just take one little moment to sidebar something, you all? Um, So flush cut versus a non-flush cut. So flush cuts happen two ways. One, the flat side of the cutter crosses the wire at 90 degrees. Okay, So that means the cut that I'm going to make here on this wire that's going to be left behind is a flush cut. Flat, blunt. The cut that's on this other side is not a flush cut. You can see that little flicker of the facet that I cut there. It's like it's pinched off. And so that's the two cuts you would make if your cutter goes straight across the wire. If your cutter goes across at an angle, this is a double, this is a double negative because I'm making two non-flush cuts at the same time, right? This cut on left behind on the wire is sharp and pointy. And this cut left behind over here is also still not flush. So it's easy to do the wrong kind of cut. You have to think just for a second or two about doing the right kind of cut. I don't have to think about it anymore. And I'm sure Kate and Janice don't have to think about it anymore either. We do it automatically and we do that little flush blunt cut on on our work that you leave behind but also we might do it um if we're going to solder we're going to do any more work on that that bit of wire itself okay i just wanted to clarify that little situation for 
I got it got away from me. Okay. So here's my bullion wire, and I can slide it off my mandrel now. Now you remember that other bullion wire I had? Let me grab it over here. The store bought what? Store bought stuff, which is super drapey and drippy. Um, there's a pretty big difference in sturdiness in these two, right? And I could have gone down a size. I did this a little bit bigger so we could be easier for you all to see. But if I'm going to cut it, I'm going to do the same kind of cuts. I'm going to have my flush cutter go right in and cut flush. And I'm going to make the same kind of cut over here. Flush. So what it's going to leave behind is a non-flush cut on this guy. So I can come back in again and get a cleaned up little cut. And that way it's not scratch and rough for my thread to go through. And anytime you need to cut off a tiny bit, it's quite okay to go in there and do that little cut. I usually leave my bullion in a long piece before I'm going to use it for something. Um, I don't bother cutting pieces because I want to cut them for each piece that I make. I want to have those the choice and the options to do just exactly what I might want to do. If I have a big finding, I might need to have a lot of bullion, right, to go around there. If I have something smaller, I might only need a little piece, right? But you're probably going to be in the neighborhood of, I throw a ruler on this. Where did my ruler go from just yesterday? There it is. If I throw a ruler on this, I'm under half an inch. I would think that most of the time for standard sort of knotting and standard bullion use, under half an inch is going to be where you're going to start. You might go smaller and you can cut the smaller if we make an error and have too much, but I would cut them as I needed to and kind of as I went along rather than cutting a bunch of little pieces. So this now is ready to get stored and it's just going to go in a little box and then it's stored for safekeeping for the next time. I don't really need to keep these separate by gauge, but you can if you want. It's usually pretty obvious to my eye what's a bigger gauge and what's a smaller gauge. And you can always measure if you need to. Okay. So all, all making your own bullion is really not, not so difficult. Um, one of the things that may be more difficult for you when you get to it is dealing with the whole size in the beads. And I know we've talked about this before, and I got to tell Kate a huge thank you for turning me on to this um, Dremel battery because I had a battery operated Dremel ages ago and it was kind of useless. It really didn't hold its charge very well. Yeah, this one's a game changer. This is a game changer. It holds charge for months. I mean, I actually take this with me to the market in case I need yeah. to do a polish on something. So um, this is a game changer. It actually uh, runs just on a charge. You plug it in, charge it up, and it's good to go. So I use a tapered diamond bit. And we sell these. They come in a little hand turn, a handle, uh, in the base of a handle. And you can use them by hand. But I find using it in a Dremel just speeds my life right along. So if I need to adjust the hole in something, if I need to smooth out the hole in something, I can use this. And I'll use this on any natural material. So um, pearls, uh, semi-precious stone, probably wouldn't do much on, would make some effect on rubies and sapphires. Rubies and sapphires are corundum. They're actually really hard. They're really um, hard. Yeah. And this diamond bit, but this diamond bit will, will go through all your other semi-precious stones. You could use it on wood. You could use it on a uh, shell. Um, everything up to metal. Um, and and with three just oh, sorry, Emily, just real quick. I have a class on Beeducation. Uh, oh, you go over to Beeducation.com. It's a whole class on drilling, a whole bunch of different natural materials, stuff like that. I did that for Lisa uh, a while back. It's super helpful. Yeah. I, I use this tool all the time. I use a small dish with a little bit of water in it. I put my beads in there and let them be wet inside. So the water does a couple things for you. Um, the water helps lubricate this tool. So it keeps it cool. Um, and it also washes away the particulates that you're grinding out. There's also a point at which it'd be nice to keep the particulates out of the air that you breathe. And um, that wetness keeps that, all those things are, are worked out by a little bit of water. So I use it with a pearl. I use it with um, a 
I'm opening up a little gemstone or two to because the holes are poorly drilled um, or just not not great. This won't make a hole from scratch, but it will it will certainly make um, any hole look bigger, be bigger and look a little nicer. There's three drill bits that come in the set, um, a short diamond bit, a long diamond bit, and a 45 degree bit. And the 45 degree bit is kind of looks like a stubby pencil point. And it will actually smooth out the hole around the bead, around the edge of the hole. So it'll make it nicer and, and uh, you know, more, more pretty looking. So you can, you can do that to it too. But these little tools are quite nice. Um, and they're actually very safe. Um, you know, it's pointing on the end, so you don't want to stab yourself with it. But I can actually put my finger on it, and nothing happens, right? Nothing's going on there. I mean, I'm actually filing away my skin, but um, nothing actually won't hurt you at all. And because this is a battery one, I don't feel worried about having water around it um, because uh, my bowl is usually very small, so I'm not going to drop the whole thing in there. Um, you know, doing it over a soap full of soapy water with dishes is a little bit of a different story but just a small amount of water and it actually works really, really well. Um, I, again, this was something that I had to learn about and I remember being extremely skeptical. Um, I think I was interacting with Chris Silva and she said, oh yeah, I just remount the hold the beads all the time. And I said, really? She said, oh yeah. And I said, don't you break them a lot? She goes, well, no, never. <laughs> and I said, really? So you can actually open up the holes and beads and you'd be amazed at what you could do. If you have a pearl, you want to put it on leather, you can do it with this, you know. Um, you got a gemstone that has two holes meeting in the middle and they're not such a great drill job. Huh. You can do it with this. It'll actually work really, really well for you. Um, so a super, super useful tool. Um, okay. So Kate, I think I've kind of said what I have to say about bullion. Huh. What else you got for me, Kate? Here I am. I was throwing something away. Oh. Um, yes. So it looks fantastic, M. Are you going to uh, show, I, I don't know if you want to show stringing something through or you want to just show your, your end piece. Uh, how, how do you determine how much bullion you want to use? You know, um, I t tend to try and do things in scale between my clasp and my beads. If I have really, really small beads, I'm going to use really fine bullion, um, and I'm not going to cut a very long piece. Right. But I want to make sure that it covers the thread entirely. Right. You want that movement there yep. so that Absolutely. it's not, um, yeah. Yeah. So, and on the drilling, just an FYI, we're getting some good comments about oh, yeah. pearls and shells and that kind of thing. All of those, that dust in the air, like Emily was saying, she uses water. Um, it's a good rule of thumb never to drill anything dry, for sure. Yeah, and you know, the you want that bit, that diamond bit to last as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So the water is helping cool it. It's helping lubricate it. It's kind of doing a bunch of jobs that are all, mm -hmm. all good. And um, I'm just amazed at how, what these will do. And, yeah. you know, there was a point in my life where I, I understood about how holes were drilled in beads and how difficult it was to do that. And so I accepted with the blind faith that the hole was the hole and there was no going, no changing, no going back. That's right. Yeah. But that's not true. <laughs> Nope. You can drill them out and you can absolutely drill them out. Yeah. And I show on the education video using a hand drill. I also talk about using a drill press. I cover extensively cover safety, et cetera. So if you jump over to beadjucation.com and you just look up drilling or drilling video, it's all there. Um, and I'll do that. I'll repeat that for you guys someday here because I love Emily that you love that little Dremel. It's such a oh. handy tool. I, you showed it to me and I, I think we were at the retreat. Yeah. You showed it to me and, and I like went and ordered one while you were talking about it. I think you did. That's right. I got to have that. No, they work really well. I do use my, my Fordham as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I can use that in, in um, my messy area of my shop, but mm -hmm. for a I'm quick, putting this all um, on the oh, there we are for a there quick um, 
job. These guys work really well. And yeah, they do. Yeah. So and I you know, encourage you guys to try making some of your own bouillon in, in having it around and having that as a, a finding that you can make anytime and you can make it, cut it to make it the right size for your particular piece. Gosh, there's, there's no, no going back for me. You know, yeah. I do really like bouillon. And it has such a really nice, like you were saying, a nice finish. Um, and that coiling, like you were doing around the pearl, the coiling for the bullion. Oh, and yeah. when I coil um, for, uh, like when I'm making jump rings, et cetera, it's all right. the same motion, all super, yep. super handy. Yep. Um, well, it looked like somebody was interested in seeing you make jump rings too, Kate. Um, so. Yeah, I have a few. Uh, it looks like I've got a few shows uh it's stacking to, up to stack up you know after the beginning of the year folks we're going to be adding some of my metal smithing uh tools and things here to the uh beadshop.com website um so we'll be playing around a little more with some some sawing i i promise you i have been sawing metal for a million years it feels like and I will teach you how to love your jeweler saw 100%. It is, it is so freeing. I'll tell you. I, you know, I, it takes me a minute to get into the meditation of it. And I know somebody else met, mentioned that here that you never want to let it see your fear, you know? Um, yeah, no, and, that's right. <laughs> that is, that's what I tell you. you. You definitely want to be the boss. And I know that's one of Kate's, you know, um, uh, mantras, you know, you're the boss, so you take control. And, and I do think I don't, I probably don't saw enough on a daily basis. And if I sat myself down and said, okay, I'm going to saw out five or seven different new things. By the time I got to the end of that seventh one, I would be, okay, I'm back in love with this again. Yeah. Back in love with you know? it. Yeah. Well, I just made a piece of, and then we'll get to a question we have. I just made a piece of jewelry for some family friends and I hadn't made a piece like a serious metalsmith piece in over a year. It had been a while and I had not picked up that jeweler saw. And I'll tell you that jeweler saw and I, yeah, I was no, like, where, no. where have you been? My darling. <laughs> so. Looks um, like you just wanted me to shut, cut some, uh, cut a yeah, few. Yeah, to cut here. some. So if you don't mind, yeah, no, no, uh, no, no, no. just real quick, how we cut those the same length. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you one more time. Sure. I think, um, Janice, I think the easiest way is to simply line them up in your fingers to get that same length. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the easiest way to go, right? You may have to come back in and deal with those little um, non-flush ends, though. So just remember that the flat side of your cutter crossing the wire at 90 degrees gives you a flush cut. Nothing else does. That's the only time you get it that way. Okay. Yeah. So I'd have to come back in here really tight and cut off that end. And you'll know because it'll be like silk. It'll be like velvet versus burlap or yeah, something. Yeah, versus scratchy. a little sticker. Yeah. Right? I'm I'm allergic to burlap, so I stay away from it. But um gives me the sneezes. So you never had to bag walnuts and burlap, Emily? I did with a running nose. Yeah, I. It really. <laughs> we had to bag I, walnuts. I, and those burlap burlap. <laughs> yeah. Um, I grew up on a walnut farm. My parents had acres of walnuts. And every day I would come home from school at walnut season and there'd be buckets on the back porch for me to fill. We got paid 50 cents a bucket. <laughs> three buckets to fill a bag. And I don't know, that weighed like, that might've weighed like 35 or 40 pounds. And then we would have the bags all around in the orchard and we would, my dad would drive the truck <laughs> and we would have to pick the bag up off the ground. Toss <laughs> those bags back. Yeah. But pretty soon they taught me how to drive because I was kind of slow. I wasn't <laughs> strong enough to do it. I was too small. And um, that was when I learned how to drive the truck because it was better that I drove and my dad and my brother or any of the crew that we hired were throwing the bags. Um, so, you know, yeah. granny gear, granny On gear. On the farm. Like, truck. Yep. We learned how to drive early, early, early. Yeah, sure. 12 or 13 maybe. Yeah. I so would drive know. my granddad's tractor. I don't know. I was little. Um, real quick. Um, so... 
Bullion into jump rings. Bullion, if you shape a piece of bullion in the round into a jump ring, it's not going to, it needs a armature on the inside. Yeah, no, you know, um, one of the things I showed, I think last week was, or last Wednesday was using bullion over a wire wrap. Mm -hmm. And this is another way to problem solve. And, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe this is me being funny, but I really like the proportion of the materials I'm working with to all work together. And until I don't, until I want it to be really out of scale. So most of the time when I'm looking at something um, small, I want the wire wrap to be small. And that is accommodated by the fact that the wire is actually fairly small because item is small and the hole is small. All those things kind of follow in line. But frequently you will find bigger beads with small holes. Mm -hmm. And so for me, taking, like if I took, this particular bead, this like carved um, serpentine bead, and I put a head pin on it, a standard head pin, and make my loop. And I want a big loop. I want it to be balanced with the item that I'm making. Putting bullion wire over something helps give it some more scale. Right, some more bulk. Makes it more bulky and, and balances it just a tiny bit with mm -hmm. what I'm doing. So... Sometimes the bullion wire is there for looks. Like with this leather piece on the leather, I didn't need bullion here. Mm -mm. It's it nice. looks nice though. It looks nice. And it has, again, it has some transition value for me mm -hmm. that it goes from leather to metal with some connection. So um, I know that when Kate and I do design on our own, when we're not, when we're making something for ourselves, we're making something for, um, a gift or for sale, we think about design stuff kind of automatically. It kind of doesn't, it's not something we spend a lot of time like angsting over so much. When we're making something that we're going to teach, then we do spend a lot more time thinking about the design in the, in the sense of the mechanics of it, how we're going to make it, how we're going to show it. <clears throat> Are we doing this with a good purpose? Is this something valuable here? Or, you know, and is this a transition? Is this the continuation of this piece, all those things kind of happen. And we're thinking about them, at least for me, I think about them a little more in the front of my brain. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I do my own sort of designing things, it's happening kind of more organically for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just different. And it's, I think it's interesting to kind of talk about what we think about when we do designs. Um, and that's, that actually is a whole show right there, Kate. It's a whole show on design. Um, we haven't really done that. I don't think, you know, where we've really just talked about, how we do stuff and maybe how, and I, I talked about this a little bit the other day when we were talking about nodding that Janice and Kate and I approach things from very different angles and with different experiences. Cause we've all had been taught by different people or had so many years of this or so many years of that, or we don't do it at all. You know, I mean, Janice doesn't solder jump rings. I don't know if she knows how to solder a jump ring. We can show her how and teach her how and she can do it, <laughs> but she doesn't do it sort of as a regular matter of course, mm -hmm. but you and I, mm -hmm. oh, Soldering and jumpering, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think with our own design stuff, we kind of do it very organically in our heads and it kind of flows out and it, it's just, a, just different. That's all. Um, it's interesting. And I think it would, it might be inspirational for other folks too to, you know, loosen up how they do things or something. Janice is saying, nope, she does not solder. No <laughs> JP. It's for sure. Um, a couple of things I wanted sure. to clarify. I mean, when I started teaching soldering at bead shop, Janice was like, keep me out of that room. <laughs> keep me out of it. Um, I don't want people to get confused with the way that you had the bullion covering that ring on the top of that right. level versus so that there's an armature in there. Right. Just bullion wire formed into a circle without an armature in it won't really hold. No, right? not strong enough. Not strong enough. So right. if you want to use, make a jump ring that has a bullion wire covering, open and close it that way, but it needs to have an armature in it. Most of the thought, time. I've never thought about that before. Um, 
I would say if you made 20 gauge bullion, mm -hmm. use 20 gauge as your coiling wire um, and soldered it together. Made right. It soldered. Solder yeah. It and it, work hardened it. Still, it would still deform under enough pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and it would sort of look like a flower. You know, I'm, right. I'm imagining right. it in my head. It's it's right. not going to. So let me come back here. As I bend this bullion wire with nothing underneath it, can you see how it doesn't coil easy, evenly? Right, how it opens up a bit. How it opens up. So if I bend this bullion wire with wire inside of it, can you see how it coils, not how it how it flares kind of equally? Mm -hmm, nice form, and even. Right? So that's kind of the difference. The reason we don't use bullion with nothing inside. Because it doesn't do exactly what we want to do. If we were to scale up a bunch, so I don't I don't think I would do make 20 gauge, um, and then I'm speaking about the wrapping wire. If I would make 20 gauge wire, I probably would do it on a drill. And mm -hmm. even so, I don't think it would be strong enough without deforming to mm -hmm. be something that would hold up on its own without hold a up on its own. Yeah. 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 Now you also could use that bullion wire. I'm going to put us all on. Sure. Use that bullion wire and you'd clip it. That's how you'd make the jump rings and you'd wrap it around like a larger mandrel, like a, three sixteenth or a half inch mandrel or whatever that is. And you clip them or you saw them to become the jump rings. Yeah. Let me just, um, I know we went into that and we didn't, it wasn't really, um, hold on. I have okay. a new flyer that Kate just sent me. Can I just, we do. Me? That is correct. So me, I'm going to solo really you here. <laughs> this is a really Oops, cool. Flyer. No, I'm soloing me. Hang on. Sorry. There we solo go. Me, please, please. This is a great flyer. Um, it's a round nose plier. Uh, I would not use this for wire wrapping particularly. I, I get the idea that this would allow me to make every loop the same size because it's not tapered. But if I do that, um, it's not as sort of functional getting into the spots that I want to get into. So it's the right idea, but I don't think it's quite the right tool. Everyone is trying to make, if you're struggling making loops all the same size, with a chain nose, a round nose plier, believe me, there are people who are trying to engineer you a tool that will make the loops the same size every, every time and be really easy. And frankly, by the time you master that tool, you would have mastered it anyway with a round nose plier. So round nose pliers are really the jam. They're really the way to go. So this tool is really meant for making coils. And I went ahead and labeled all the sizes. So this actually allows me to make a jump ring that's a particular size, right? If I go for this seven millimeter one. That's really clever, Emily, to um, mark them. You know, um, it won't last forever, but it will last for a while. This is 18 gauge wire, right? And I'm just, I'm using that little chunk that I was using a moment ago as a coil. You see how delicately I'm grabbing and I'm still marring that wire a little bit. It's a couple little dings. But I'm going to take it all the way around and make a big fat coil. That's a seven millimeter inside diameter. No, it's actually probably a little bit bigger. Um, jump ring. So I'm going to make this into jump rings. I'm going to cut with my flush cutter across the wire. And that little piece that goes away is not flush. And I have to turn my cutter over to cut here to get two flush ends on my jump ring. That means that I have to come in again and trim. You can make your own jump rings all day long. It's kind of fun, actually. If I was going to make more than five or six, I would resort to a drill. Yeah. Trim. But that that tool, I you do that just what you're doing, Emily, right there. Yep. If I need to crank out just a few jump rings, that's yep. exactly how I do it. Yep. This is how I make stacking rings too. Yeah, exactly. Only bigger stack rings are jump rings only bigger to fit your finger. Right. Indeed. Kate, 
You chant. You're saying exactly what I say. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. Sorry. So, um, bent chain nose pliers are super helpful, and whenever you grasp a jump ring, you always want to grasp um, a good bit of it at a time. I'm going to open and close a couple times, going past its little opening, and I'm putting a little of inward pressure when I'm open so that my jump ring closes up. That's pretty good. I need a file. No, maybe not. So there's a closed jump ring. Okay. Very nice. So clean. Easy. Easy peasy. You know, you need a couple jump rings. Psh, you can yeah, make it. Done and done. And then we could go forward and solder those closed or Absolutely. whatever it is that you'd want to do. Yep. Um, someone asked about the, um, and we're getting towards wrapping it up, but I wanted to say someone asked about where does the name bullion come from? And I think it's because, and I could be wrong, but bullion, like gold bullion, you know, in bars or whatever it's known right. as bullion. I think like you were saying earlier, Emily, the, um, how it's used in embroidery and stuff like that, that was made of gold. Yeah. I, and I, so, I think that's the same, same yeah. sort of way. I mean, you know, they used to, and they still do, I guess, weave with gold wire. So mm -hmm. gold, where you literally have fabric that has stiffness to it mm -hmm. and, and it stands out. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's where it's coming from too. Kate. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. From, so, from gold. You know, yeah. um, as long as you know, you're talking about wire, not soup. You're good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Though I also like soup. Me too. Me <laughs> too. I soup. sometimes have soup instead of a cup of tea. Because That's right. I tasty. love my soup. You know? um, okay. So let me do this real quick. My friends, I'm going to cover Emily up for just a moment. We want to thank you so much for watching. As always, you can find all of the information from the project today, the products that Emily uses, the wire, the tools, all of that. You can find it all on beadshop.com. Don't forget to go and download her handout that accompanies this demo. Um, so you'll have that as well to refer to. Questions anytime, hit us up at that email at info at beadshop.com. And don't forget to stay uh, in touch with us via our newsletter. Monthly mixed redos are dropping uh, tomorrow. Next week uh, is Thanksgiving week, which is crazy to think about. I'll be doing a show Wednesday, friends, but I will not be doing a show on Friday. Turkey Bead Coma. Shop, no, Bead Shop is closed from Thanksgiving Day all the way through that Monday. So if you write in or whatever, we're taking a well-earned break. So uh, we'll be back to business as normal um, on that following Monday. Um, but a big shout out, a big thank you so much of you folks. Thanks for uh, watching us today. Um, so, so great to have you all. And Emily, this, that it makes me want to, my tools are just right over there. I want to just go make bullion and string something. I see. I just was saying, uh, Leslie is saying, when is Emily uh, or you, Janice, and get live next to Kate, like in the good old days? And those were the good old days, but these are the good new days. And they are. We're actually kind of delighted to be able to get to you virtually and have this feel like we are side by side. Yeah. Kate and I just, we have a great time together. We do miss bead shopping for you. I'm anxiously awaiting Tucson coming up and uh, made my reservations the other day. So I'm, I'm ready to go. And just, you know, we, we miss that in-person stuff too, but this is really good. And this makes a lot of sense for us, you yeah. know, quite a ways away from each other. I don't know. It's maybe four or five hours from here to Fresno. So. Yeah. Yeah. And about, about three, three and a half, I think. You know, that's not as bad. Janice is, way Janice is a is a five hour flight but yeah yeah she's yeah. she's way over there but yeah um you know i know when we have our next retreat in in uh, uh san juan batista we will try and do some stuff where we're sitting all together and and kind of on the live thing so that you guys get a chance to see us all in one place yeah can. it's tough up there because the reception is so terrible yeah we just that was tough live stream. 
Yeah. Right. I don't know. The years before it wasn't as bad, but this year seemed particularly. Yeah. Um, the internet up there because we're so far in the hills. It's so, so spotty. But we have some plans to get all three of our faces on the broadcast at the same time. So uh, hopefully that will come to fruition soon. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I'm excited about uh, teaching Janice how to solder because I think she would really love that. <laughs> don't she hates to solder. <laughs> That'll be awesome. Let's just put a torch in her hand and watch her turn melt things. Rings. It's melt, okay. Melt it. Do it. Let's no, go. No. Um, no, I just, I think soldering is, you know, we, we're lucky to do uh, work with them uh, in a field that we have a little bit of magic in. And yeah. um, soldering is a little alchemical, alchemical magic. And we. It is so true. I don't, I don't know anybody who doesn't go, oh, after they do a nice joint and it's just, I know it's so satisfying. So I know. Satisfying. I, I love, love my metal. Um, there will be just a couple of questions here. There will be some surprise boxes from Tucson. I'll get to that closer Ooh, towards, because I'm going to be in Tucson that first week of February. So I'll let you folks know, I've got some ideas about it. Um, and I'd like your feedback. So I'm going to ask you that probably in January. Mm -hmm. There's a question from way back. Someone was asking about my temperature project. Uh, I'm going to update you on the temperature project. And yes, that sucker is long. I've also come up with my temperature project for 2024. So you're going to see what that is. It's going to be fun. I'm going to do it again. Because um, it's been kind of fun to my do. My temperature project is about that long. Well, uh, you know. It's, it's just not my jam, you know. It's perfectly. It keeps me, I'm all, oh, so though I did have to, I do actually have to catch up with last month, like all of last month, but you know, I'm gonna whatever. A, I'm going to make a bead out of mine yeah. around here somewhere. It'll it's be awesome. Be a little bead. Um, and I think that's, I think that's it. So friends, I will see you next Wednesday. Happy Thanksgiving, Em, if I don't talk to you beforehand. You too. Um, and everybody have a lovely Thanksgiving if you're celebrating with us. Um, you know, I know our friends to the North and to the South and in other countries, Thanksgiving is, is a American holiday and we, we do really enjoy it. Um, and uh, it's our moment to be grateful and not that we're not grateful all the time, but it is a time where we try and focus on that bit of gratitude. So um, yeah, for we're sure. grateful for all of you and we really thank you for jo you joining us. Yeah. One, it's really a lot of fun. 100%. I was yelling at Chris this morning going gratitude, gratitude. <laughs> Yes. I couldn't, he was doing something or he bought, and he bought me some flowers or whatever. And I didn't know what else to say. So, so a lot of gratitude for you, Emily, a lot of gratitude for you folks out there. I'll see you on Wednesday and thanks. This was a really fun, um, yeah, was a lot super of fun, informative. Huh? Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. So Have much. a wonderful holidays. See you. All right, everybody. I'll see you next week. week. Thanks, Em. You bet. Bye.